Turn down the house. Could you turn down the house? Uh, the clip came off when you were in there. No, I found it. Uh, you me too. No, the broadcast live to the show. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. And webcast. Mr. Fuhrer, perfect. Foyer. Yep, yep. Foyer, Mr. Foyer. Sorry. It's okay. You can sit on that or you can lay it in your lap, drop it in your pocket, clip it on your belt, or whatever you want to do. Heavy enough once it gets in there. Right. Good. So what do I do with um, it? Sit on it? <laughs> <sighs> okay. You're pretty good there. Oh, oh I just put this oh, under my oh, leg. You can put it somewhere that it won't bother you. Alright. Uh, oh, you want me to move this higher? Or? Doesn't say anything here about the um, my about the seminar at Georgetown. Yeah. Georgetown <laughs> University. Does. Oh yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Okay, okay. Can you get a mention that? No, I'm not going to mention that unless I feel I feel some need to embarrass you. I will. I will find that. I will say that it's an honor to be sitting next to my former professor. Professor, if only he'd given me better grades. Please. Well, this is this is your makeup. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're going to get started. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Ross Wiener from the Aspen Institute's Education and Society Program. Um, we're delighted that you could be here this afternoon for this discussion about the new Comprehensive Assessment Consortia. Um, before turning it over to our featured speakers, I want to um, introduce the author of the brief that we're uh, releasing this afternoon. Joaquin Tamayo is the Assistant Director of the Education and Society Program here at the Aspen Institute. He's joined us this summer. Uh, he is a former high school teacher in the Los Angeles Unified School District and then a, um, a former uh, principal. He went through New Leaders for New Schools and was the founding principal of a small high school in New York City and more recently was a principal at the, one of the Cesar Chavez schools here in Washington, D.C. And so we're delighted that he joined us. Um, just a word of context, some of you might know the Aspen Institute Education Program facilitates a network of urban school district leaders and a lot of that work is just helping them to share with each other um, what they're doing and what they can learn from one another but we also try to um, sort of <coughs> sort for them uh, you know this kind of cacophony of, of, of national developments and try to figure out um, what they need to know and so we actually developed this brief for our urban school district leaders and at the back of the brief you'll see sort of some questions that we thought would be useful for them to be thinking about as they start to approach this work but after we, we used this with, uh, with a couple of those network meetings, we realized that there's lots of folks who are probably interested in, in this work right now, and so we d thought we would put it out um, publicly. And then actually, um, again, we're really thrilled um, at the folks who joined us this afternoon um, to kind of uh, to, to begin this national conversation about the implications of this really important work. So again, thanks for joining us, and let me turn it over to Joaquin. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, today. So when you came in, you noticed on your chair the uh, new assessment consortium brief that we've designed as a tool for understanding the major structural elements of the uh, assessment consortium and their proposed assessments uh, as they get ready for full scale implementation in the 2014-2015 school year. Uh, for six of those structural elements, including the consortia governance and membership, assessments for accountability, additional assessments not for accountability, uh, assessment descriptions, technology and capacity requirements for states and districts, and implementation timelines. We hope our analysis, which is a side-by-side -side comparison, will help the reader understand where the systems converge and then also where they diverge. Uh, 
in their approach to designing comprehensive assessment systems that the states will be implementing simultaneously uh, in the next four years. Uh, we hope this information is useful to policymakers and practitioners as they gear up for that implementation. Uh, for context and with respect to the system design, there are four significant areas of convergence between the consortia. One, all assessments within each consortium will be common across the states and aligned to the new Common Core State Standards in English Language Arts and Mathematics. Further, the common uh, assessment standards and cut scores will allow for cross-state comparability of student performance within each consortium. Two, both Park and Smarter will require students to take performance-based assessments for accountability. These tasks will use enhanced assessment items to assess critical thinking, higher order skills, uh, using tasks like essay writing and research. Three, Park and Smarter Balance assessments will be computer-based, with a few exceptions in the early grades. All the new assessments, including the performance tasks, will be administered via, via computer and online resources. And four, student performance in the new assessments will, will be reported to reflect progress and growth against college and career readiness standards, <coughs> not just absolute levels of student achievement. There are, however, important differences between the Park and Smarter Balance uh, approaches that we like to highlight today. First, with respect to the summative assessments, Park will design what it calls a through-course model of summative assessment, where quarterly assessments are administered to all students in both English language arts and mathematics. The student summative scores for accountability will be aggregated throughout the school year, beginning with the first quarterly assessment. Smarter Balance assessments, on the other hand, will be administered only in the last 12 weeks of the school year. Second, PARC will require testing of all students in grades 3 through 11 every single year. Smart Balance will require testing in grades 3 through 8 and then only once in high school by the 11th grade. Three, Smart Balance assessments will be computer adaptive, a method of test administration which adjusts the level of difficulty based on the student's previous uh, answer to the test item. PARC's assessments will also computer based will be will, uh, adhere to a single form for all students at each grade level. Finally, Smarter Balance plans to set their initial cut scores after field testing in the summer of 2014, whereas Park will set their cut scores after the full-scale uh, administration of the system in the summer of 2015. We hope that today's conversation will highlight some of those opportunities and challenges towards building a next generation assessment system that sends the right signals to states, districts, and schools to improve student uh, outcomes. I would like to now introduce today's panel. First, we have Laura Slover. Laura Slover is Senior Vice President at Achieve. Laura has senior responsibility for leading a new unit at Achieve that is tasked with overseeing the design, development, and implementation of the next generation assessment system developed by PARC, the Partnership for the Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers a consortium of 24 states and the District of Columbia. She uh, joined Achieve in 1998, and since then has held a number of positions, most recently as Vice President for Content and Policy Research. <coughs> Dr. Joe Wilhoff is Executive <coughs> Director of the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. Most recently, Joe served as Assistant Superintendent for Assessment and Student Information for the Office of su the Superintendent for Public Instruction in Washington State. In that capacity, Joe is responsible for the statewide testing program and for collecting and reporting student information for the state, including the state's longitudinal student database. Dr. Wilhoff currently chairs the NAEP Policy Task Force for the National Assessment Governing Board, a collaborative effort co-sponsored by the board and the Council of Great, I'm sorry, Council of Chief State School Officers. And finally, we have Dr. Michael Fuhrer. Is, and Dr. Fuhrer is the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Human Development at George Washington University. Before joining GW this year, Dr. Fuhrer held several positions at the National Research Council of the National Academies, most recently as the Executive Director of the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences in Education. Dr. Fuhrer's most recent book is Moderating the Debate, Rationality and the Promise of American Education, published by Harvard Education Press in 2006. He is a member of the National Academy of Education, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a fellow of the American Education Research Association. We'll begin today's conversation with remarks from each of our panelists about the opportunities and challenges represented by their consortia, and then we'll open the floor to questions and a dialogue with all of our participants today. We'll start with Laura. Thank you. Is this on? Yep. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a particular pleasure to be here on this panel with my friend Joe and um, with Michael Foyer, who was my professor at Georgetown University. And hopefully he'll give me a good grade for this uh, presentation. Yeah. Hopefully I'll be able space. to make up my <laughs> performance. It's that incomplete from a while back. <laughs> Still by. working it off. <laughs> and thank you, Ross, for hosting. Um, it's a good opportunity to talk about the opportunities first before we talk about the challenges. Uh, so I'll, I'll take a moment to frame just a few of the opportunities and then my colleague Joe and I are going to demonstrate um, early collaboration in this project and collaborate on what we see as some of the, the challenges uh, ahead of us as we move to um, implement these assessment systems. So opportunity. First of all, um, Joaquin started walking through some of the opportunity. This is an incredible, op incredible opportunity to really change the face of assessment and change the way that we do assessment in this country. Um, first and foremost, by making it more meaningful, basing it on standards that are more rigorous and more connected to what matters out there in the world, um, critical thinking, strategic problem solving, writing, research, inquiry, all the things we want our students to be able to do by the time they graduate from high school and go off into college or into a career. <clears throat> That's what the opportunity of the Common Core offers us, and the assessments that will be built around those Common Core um, will need to measure those, those standards and those skills. So that's first, um, more rigorous, um, more deep coverage of meaningful content. Secondarily, though, it's an, also an opportunity to be a better, to offer opportunities for better drivers of performance, better drivers for teacher improvement, student improvement, and school improvement, because the data that we hope to get from these assessments will be um, much more connected to the curricula students take and delivered much more quickly so that it can impact um, decisions being made in the classroom um, on a weekly basis so that students who miss content can go back and be retaught uh, so that by the end of the year they've been given a chance to, caught, to catch up. An additional opportunity is by grounding uh, these assessments um, as the standards are grounded in what's most important for colleges and career and always having that endpoint in mind, kids will know throughout the system whether they're on track to being ready for college and careers and if not, um, they'll be given an opportunity to make up for lost time and make up um, and so that they can get back on track. And that's a real difference um, that I see um, in how we're moving forward on, in both of these assessment consortia, to always have the goal um, in mind, to have the end in mind so that you know what to do to get there. Uh, lastly, I think it's a real opportunity for collaboration across states, uh, not just across and between consortia, but even within consortia. States haven't been about the business of collaborating in this way on assessments um, in our history. This will be the first time on any grand scale um, where states will be reporting back data, performance level data, um, in common across all their states <coughs> down to the student level, and that will provide incredible opportunities for looking at uh, best practices, what's working particularly well, uh, sharing across states, and, and really actually uh, using states uh, to push one another to do even better. So that's a little bit about the opportunities. I'm sure you want to add a little on opportunities. Well, you know, I, I think uh, uh, in parallel to your uh, notion of uh, opportunities for collaboration, um, you know, consequences like uh, the opportunity for teacher preparation uh, with regard to regardless of where uh, teachers are, are prepared uh, for joining the workforce, there will be a, a, a common uh, sense of uh, what it means and what the students' needs are in, say, a third grade or a fourth grade classroom uh, for uh, students to, uh, uh, to know and be able to do and, and what kinds of strategies and methods uh, work best uh, to get students to meet those goals. So uh, there's going to be just a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities of scale that, uh, that this will bring to have us really be more effective uh, in our work, we think. So maybe now we should transition to challenges because there are certainly a number of challenges. And Joe and I <clears throat> had the opportunity to put our heads together to think about challenges in five big buckets. They're operational challenges, they're policy challenges, political challenges, timeline challenges, and then collaboration challenges. We wanted to start with that as um, an opportunity, but it's also a challenge, so we want to talk about that. Um, we're going to start with some operational challenges, okay. so Joe's going to go first. Um, so we have this homework assignment that's due in four years, which is to put a test out on the streets, and uh, we hope we don't take an incomplete in, 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 in that one. Um, and they do present, uh, both of our proposals uh, include uh, some uh, design principles 
uh, that, uh, that really will uh, push us. Uh, the, one of which is we will both be relying substantially on uh, artificial intelligence uh, mechanisms for scoring some of our more complex assessment tasks uh, and events. And quite frankly, we're not sure, neither consortium is sure that the current state of affairs in artificial intelligence scoring is where it needs to be for us to take full advantage of it. So this is one area in which we have agreed to try to collaborate on. We, we don't think that there would be a unique smarter balance solution to that and, as opposed to a unique uh, park solution to that, uh, to that challenge. Uh, <laughs> but it, it does stand, uh, stand before us and we need to uh, get to work on that. I'm going to get down into the weeds a little bit here with regard to some of the operational and technical challenges, but uh, there, uh, the scores on these assessments ultimately in the final analysis for high school kids do need to be comparable regardless of what consortium uh, a, a state happens to belong to. Uh, the, the entire effort really begins to, to, to crumble and fall if a student in Florida uh, is declared to be ready for college and careers and that same student moves to Washington and is declared not to be ready for college and careers. It just, it just won't work that way. So we do need to have it's sort of the sine qua non of this whole effort is comparability not only within the consortia but across the two consortia. Uh, that in and of itself presents some pretty substantial equating uh, and uh, standard setting challenges for us. Um, uh, there are two consortia. They will have two different solutions to the way we, uh, they, we will be uh, assessing students and the kinds of questions we'll be asking students. Uh, and so how to build that comparability in um, it is not, certainly not undoable, but it, uh, it will be a challenge and, and require a certain amount of, uh, of cooperation. Both consortia will be faced with uh, uh, unique challenges that this new assessment system uh, will have with regard to uh, scaling items and scaling the tests themselves. Uh, the, uh, the requirements from the Department of Education do call for uh, assessments of growth, measures of growth for individual youngsters. Uh, and those are not trivial uh, issues uh, with regard to uh, how, we, uh, how we define that and uh, how we uh, go about uh, assessing that. Um, and unfortunately, the research community does not currently speak with one voice with regard to what growth looks like, what growth means, how you, uh, how you measure it. And uh, so we're going, to, uh, we're going to need to drill down uh, into that um, uh, pretty substantially. Um, I think I'll stop at, at that point. And uh, Laura, see if you want to have any comments with regard to policy issues or political issues. Yes, I will. One additional operational thing I think that will be tricky is the, is the test security issue. These are a lot of students taking tests on a lot of different days across states. How do you do that and enable students to take tests when it makes the most sense for them to take it, particularly in the park design what, that relies on through course assessments that happen through the course of the year without jeopardizing test security? Because that is going to be a high uh, priority across states, particularly when scores will be used uh, for, the, for accountability purposes. So I think that's a really uh, big technical challenge that, <clears throat> that Joe's going to figure out for us. <laughs> um, some policy challenges. Uh, one of the biggest policy challenges is actually around transition to the Common Core standards. Uh, that is sort of the base uh, from which everything else has to follow. And for states uh, that are now in the process of transitioning to Common Core standards, um, there are things like how do you move from the standards you have to the new standards in a way that brings all your teachers and um, along with you and teachers and school leaders. Uh, so it's not just something else that's dropped on top of them, but they can see the connections. They can really see what's different and unique about these standards. Uh, many states have done what they call mapping exercises or alignment exercises to see where their current standards are or are not different from the Common Core and what that means for their transition, and many of them took that as a box checking exercise in order to make the case for adoption, right? We don't have to change so much because our standards are, we're almost there. Um, going back and thinking about what it means to implement, I think, requires a different kind of alignment study. Uh, it's not just where do the standards look similar, it's really what is the intention and what, is, what does it mean for practice. So number one policy challenge, I think, will be transitioning effectively and meaningfully to the standards, which will require states and districts and schools to engage their teachers in a, in a deeper way on really spending time with the standards. I want to just pause for a moment to 
acknowledge Chris Minnick, who's here from CCSSO. Chris and his counterpart at NGA, Eileen Berman, really led the, the Common Core Standards Development effort. So this is all your fault. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I do think that's a big challenge. And, and Joe, who's just most recently been at a state, um, can talk a little bit about what that, what that does look like. Well, you know, it, fundamentally, that is a, a challenge that both consortia recognize and acknowledge, and we'll do whatever we can to facilitate uh, states' uh, effective implementation of the Common Core. But in the final analysis, it's not our primary task, it is, is not to make sure that that implementation happens. We have to build assessments, and our resources and our energies and our timelines and our requirements are around developing assessments. Now, those will probably not be the best assessments if, they're, if, they're com if we're completely blind to the implementation issues and so forth and so on. But uh, fundamentally, the implementation issue does need to be addressed uh, kind of outside of the work or in collaboration with the consortia, but not as work that the consortia lead. This has to be work that is led within <coughs> states and uh, hopefully through collaboration of states. And uh, in our analysis within our consortium anyway, uh, there's, there's, we're at risk of having some uh, vacuum with regard to that being a, an effort that is moving forward at the same level of energy and focus as the assessments. I think the park states see it a little bit differently, agree that the, the main focus of the grant, particularly the main grant, uh, the, the main grant for the assessment development is to develop an assessment. Uh, the department also gave each consortium yes. uh, what was called a supplemental grant following the initial grant award in September. So in October, they nicely came back to us each and said, uh, we have a little bit more money for you. It's a nice thing to have happen. It doesn't happen a lot. Um, around, so to use that to support uh, the states as they implement the standards and the assessments. And so one of the things the Park Consortium will be doing around this implementation challenge is to um, use some of that, those dollars for convening um, and to think about tools and opportunities for strategic collaboration across states to help think through not only um, standards implementation, which is uh, the first step, but also the transition of existing assessments to the new assessment systems. And what are the ways that states are thinking about that and how might they, they inform each other. So that's actually the second sort of policy mm -hmm. challenge that we, that we agreed was very high on states' lists. So what do we, what do, we do with um, tests that we're currently giving students, for which, frankly, we are responsible um, to the federal government for reporting out results on up until 2014, <laughs> 15, when we change, and, and yet we're implementing new standards um, and teachers are starting to look to those and wanting to teach to those. So those two um, components of the system are going to very quickly be out of, out of sync. Uh, and so thinking with states about what they're going to do about existing assessment systems. So a number of things um, that, that some of the states in the Park Consortium have been, have been thinking about. One is you take a look at your existing blueprints and you uh, start getting rid of the items that don't match up with the new Common Core standards. You're not changing your tests. You're just starting to direct them towards the new standards by eliminating those items that measure things that are no longer in the Common Core. That might be one option. And I know Michael is going to push back on some of these options. But another way is leave your test exactly as is, uh, but start to add supplemental items, either um, formative items or items surrounding the core set of items that address some of those Common Core standards that aren't uh, in your standards. Or if you have a set of assessments that doesn't actually include performance items at the moment, you might think of adding performance items to start signaling that, in fact, uh, both consortia will have uh, heavy premium placed on performance level items. So those are some of the things that states are considering. And there are a few states that are letting new contracts right now for new mm -hmm. assessments to be built just for this interim period. Uh, so there is some of that going on. And, and thinking about uh, the cost-benefit analysis to get there, I think, is something states are going to have to think hard about. So transition to new assessments and transition to uh, this Common Core are two big policy challenges ahead of all the states, I'd say. I think another uh, policy issue is, um, is, is down the road, but we need to start working on it and thinking it through right now. And that is that, uh, again, going back to the comparability question, um, uh, the, the consortia, each consortium is going to have to set its uh, the, sort of the passing scores and actually what is a, what's a, a 
uh, score in, say, eighth grade that looks like you're on path to be uh, college and career ready. And those will be common across the entire consortium. Uh, and there'll be some linkage somehow between the two consortia. Uh, right now, state superintendents, chiefs, uh, state boards of education are really pretty used to setting their own standards. Uh, and they kind of like that. Uh, and uh, this, for some, this will be a, 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 a level of buy-in that they may not be willing to jump on right away. Uh, and we will, uh, so we need to make sure that we uh, very carefully move forward uh, with uh, convincing folks that uh, there's actually value in, uh, in everybody using the, the same score. Uh, and um, uh, I've had some conversations with some uh, State Board of Education members in several locations. And at this point in time, it does not sit very well with all of them, particularly since State Boards of Education we're not really all that involved in the development of the Common Core Standards. I mean, they, they, you know, and so it's like, well, where we're, we didn't really have skin in this game to begin with, and now we have to uh, go along with it. So that presents a uh, sort of a, a policy, governance, political, uh, political issue. And we also wanted to address some other political issues, and maybe that's the segue uh, okay, into that. Okay, so small p political issue, I think, is around the engagement of higher education. So. If you'll remember, one of the goals for each consortium is to make sure that the high school assessments are really grounded in what it takes to be ready for college and careers. And by college, each of the consortia, I think, is defining this as prepared for readiness um, to go directly into credit-bearing courses at a post-secondary university. And that's how the Common Core defines that as well. So that is a tall order. Um, it's, it's one thing to define that, and that's hard enough because post-secondary faculty define um, they're not in, uh, all in agreement about what that means uh, to be ready for first-year courses. In fact, if you look at the syllabi of first-year courses across institutions in, um, any, within a state or across states, you'll find that those syllabi, even for courses with the same name, often look very different. And Achieve has done some of that work um, and looked at syllabi across states and found that there's vastly different expectations, even for a course called College Algebra. So I see a lot of nods. That's not news to you. But it does make the setting of the bar quite challenging. Then if you bring it up to a level of sort of the policy, the higher ed policymakers who all have sort of individual responsibility over their institutions, <clears throat> or in some cases a, an entire system, um, bringing them to the table to have them agree on um, first-year courses and a cut score that would indicate readiness for those is going to be quite a political challenge. I think harder in some ways than bringing state chiefs to the table, um, even though that in and of itself is a political challenge because, as Joe said, everybody's been used to uh, figuring out what it means to be prepared in their own state and going through their own board adoption processes. Um, bringing that uh, to a higher level and thinking about what's, what's important for the, the common good does introduce some political challenge. There's also a, a capital P political challenge around um, ESEA reauthorization. And uh, that is sort of on both consortia's mind. It's mm -hmm. sort of the, um, the elephants in the closet, although it's not really in the closet. It's right out in the middle of the room thinking about how to negotiate uh, the building of these new assessment systems and think about that in a framework that very clearly is going to be outdated um, for thinking about these new assessments. And I don't know if you want to um, take that further. Well, it's, uh, you know, we, it's we do have four years to get this thing done, but it's uh, four years not very much time to, to <coughs> do the lift that we both have to do. And uh, uh, it, <coughs> absent reauthorization of ESEA in a relatively short order, uh, we'd, end up be, we'd end up building tests against uh, a, a framework that we're not quite sure, you know, we'd have to kind of bet that it's going to look like this or bet that it's going to look like that. And, that's a, a, a level of uh, ambiguity that uh, that would be that would make it much more difficult to do a high quality uh, job in, uh, on the assessment side, and probably put uh, you know put folks in an awkward position of uh, well we have this test maybe we should rewrite the reauthorization so that it fits this test, and we don't any of us want to be in a situation where uh, Congress is is being told to make a decision based on what the assessment currently looks like. That's just not going to work. So it's a, that's kind of a big, as you say, elephant uh, in the room. I'm mindful of the time, Laura, and I know we want to give okay. Mike time to respond and get questions from the audience. So Keep, keep talking. This okay. Uh, so the last challenge we wanted to talk about, oh, we have two more. Okay. Timeline and collaboration. Mm -hmm. So 
Timeline. Well, you've already talked about that challenge. This is a very short timeline. It seemed long at the time we were writing the proposal, <laughs> four years. Oh, we got but then that. when you actually look at all the things that need to be done, you know, just on the development strand of work, the political side, the engagement side, think of all of the people in states um, and in organizations across the country who need to be engaged so that they can, when these tests actually get rolled out, stand behind them, and support them. It's a very, very short timeline to do a lot of work. So I think that is, to some extent, um, the biggest challenge we have because it, it really impacts everything else. And, and one of the particular things that I think we all know that is going to be a challenge is the technology infrastructure in, in states. It's just not there, and yet we are building on, on the expectation that it will be there when this is ready to be delivered in four years. And four years is going to be a very short timeline for the field to catch up and be ready to deliver, score, and report results back on these common platforms um, in a way that every kid in every school can actually take these tests. That, I think, may be the single biggest hurdle mm -hmm. ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And um, another, another issue that, that sort of uh, bridges across uh, both timeline and cooperation is um, we're going to be writing items in 2011, basically, uh, for a 2014 test because we need to pilot them and scale them and so forth and so on. So the test that we deliver will be the best that we know how to do in something like the 2011, maybe pushing to 2012 time frame. Uh, I think there's a notion that these tests will be used more than once. Uh, so probably in 2015, 2016, 2017, students will be taking tests and looking at tasks and and challenges and events and so forth and so on to, to perform to that we thought were the best we could do in 2012 because there currently really is no plan for ongoing improvement, ongoing development, ongoing updating of the assessment system and that's something that we need, we, we've both become aware that we need to, uh, need to focus on and by both becoming aware of it there, this is this odd situation that Laura and, and I are in and are representing our two consortia that we're uh, both partnering together and competing against each other. And so there, there are certain things that it's like, well, of course we can do that together, like figuring out what accommodations should look like. Well, there's not going to be a unique solution to accommodations, but there will be unique solutions to other uh, elements of this uh, because we think that that's actually better uh, for all involved to come up with uh, different ways of looking at this. Uh, so both consortia are uh, uh, sort of working that boundary, trying to understand it, trying to parse it out, um, and it's, uh, I don't know, I don't know that I would classify it as a challenge or an issue, but it's a learning experience. Let me put it like that. It is. It's, a, it's an opportunity and a challenge. And as anyone knows who's collaborated before, partnering takes time and commitment. And trying to get all the other things done and establishing really good partnerships, um, it's going to be a challenge for us to both move quickly enough and stay connected. I think that's fair to say. Um, I'll also say that, just to put a finer point on one thing Joe said, this is a development grant that takes us up to the delivery of, but doesn't include actual costs for implementing, um, but it's development right up to the 2014-15 year. It, the, the challenge ahead for all of us is to think about how to sustain that over time and how to keep the momentum mm -hmm. going and how to build um, the tests of the future, you know, four, five, six, right. ten years out um, and keep it. Um, moving and figure out a governance structure that works for that. I think that's a challenge that we all need to do some thinking about. Great. So I think we're done. Mm -hmm. nice job. Well, that seems like a very helpful context, yeah. right? Uh, <laughs> seems like uh, the, the collaboration part seems to be going well, so that's encouraging. Um, Michael, will you um, give some reflections on this? And folks, please then start to think about what questions you want to ask. We'll turn it over in a few minutes. Well, thank, thanks for uh, giving me this chance to get close to um, an, an enterprise of this uh, importance and significance. Um, I think historians of American education will look back on this moment as uh, a quite special moment. Uh, it's, it, it fits in with the Common Core Standards uh, Initiative, which, uh, as far as I can tell, is actually the first time in American history that we're going to have something uh, that sounds, looks, and acts a little bit like real national standards for education. Quite extraordinary uh, since, you know, the U.S. is now 200 and 
some odd years old and that we're now getting around to this idea of um, deciding about some definition of a national ethos with respect to what, what we value in education. That said, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's taken this long. <coughs> there is something in the American psyche that is very, uh, shall we say, on the one hand, allergic to too much central authority, <laughs> and on the other hand, quite stimulated by the idea of innovation as it is exercised by smart people in different places trying to solve complex problems. So, as in many of these situations, I find myself um, uncertain, and I guess I can be swayed in both directions about the overall uh, purposes and the overall expectations from this kind of uh, uh, an exercise. I couldn't help noticing that this year 2014 is somehow going to have its own magical sort of significance. For a while there, we thought all kids would be proficient. <laughs> now we're hoping that at least the tests will be proficient. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you know, I think another and, part and of American... that would Ameri be all tests. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, another, another part of American culture is an appreciation for uh, compromise and, and the second best. So we're, we're involved now in something that could actually as both Laura and Joe have indicated, uh, really change the course of uh, assessment. Uh, being a uh, card-carrying social scientist, I feel it is my duty to uh, put a wet blanket over some of this. Um, and I do this in the spirit of really hoping that both of the consortia succeed and that the overall enterprise succeeds. Because I think what's at stake um, in addition to the questions about how many of our kids are going to actually succeed in school and then in life, there is something I think as big at stake having to do with the future of public education. And that is that if this effort at developing what is essentially a public system of accountability fails, it will just be more ammunition for those who believe that public education itself can't be judged through public means and that the only rational way for people to know how their schools are doing is to, shall we say, choose. And so for those of us who care deeply about public education as an institution, as a force in the Americanization of uh, immigrants, as a force in the establishment of a national ethos. Um, this is very high stakes mm -hmm. poker that's mm -hmm. being played here. Mm -hmm. And so my, my questions, and I'll just give you a few, are really intended in the spirit of, of wanting us to work together to make the thing work, not because I derive any kind of schadenfreude from pointing out all the possible flaws uh, that are associated with this or any other kind of reform. So in no particular order, here are some of the things that I hope you guys are really thinking about. On the business of comparability, um, I, I was almost OK with it on, when you were talking about comparability within the consortia. Because I figure, OK, at least the guys who are designing these uh, tests and writing the items will be able to instill some kind of technology and apparatus to enable comparability. It's not a trivial task. Uh, one of the more interesting projects I was associated with at the Academy had to do with a similar problem that arose after the, um, the, uh, the uh, introduction of the proposal for the voluntary national test. And it was actually a, a, a quite lovely example of the American uh, desire to have it all, uh, which essentially meant uh, why not just let all the states do their tests, and then we'll just put all the results on the same scale? This was a fairly innocently posed question by a wonderful member of Congress, uh, which led to a lot of uh, people thinking, well, gee, maybe that, that could... Turns out it's very hard to do that. Uh, and for those who are interested, you can still 
and I no longer derive any, I never did, but I certainly now no longer get any kind of commission from purchases of books from the National Academy Press, but it is still available, and it's called Uncommon Measures, and it's not a bad little volume. The idea of doing comparability across the consortia, though, just strikes me as monumentally challenging. And um, if for no other reason than on the face of it, um, and this I learned from one of the great experts in equating, uh, uh, Paul Holland, um, the better you can do equating and comparability, the less you need to. Mm -hmm. If you just think about Mm -hmm. that for a moment. And people will ask, if comparability matters so much, why don't you just give the same test? Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody's got to be ready with a, an answer to that that, if not scientifically, then at least rhetorically, reminds everybody that we have decided as a nation we don't want to give one test. We've narrowed it down to essentially two, but we're not going further than that. <laughs> and if that's the answer, then we have to be clear and that we're willing to therefore withstand Uh, some of the downside risks associated Mm -hmm. with the lack of comparability, Mm -hmm. and then to have people who can explain, uh, as Joe pointed out, what it means that a kid in Florida uh, reaches some level on that assessment system, being part of that consortium, while a kid in Washington, and I presume here you meant Washington State, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, may actually in most ways be doing fine and just as fine, just has a different score or whatever it is. They just have to keep that in mind. People will ask. I bet you there are people in this room who are going to ask and who are going to write it on their blogs. So be careful. Um, on, on the business of... Um, I, I heard very little from either of, of, of you today about the special issues associated with accommodation, English language learners, uh, children with uh, various kinds of... Uh, disabilities or uh, other special circumstances, it will be important for you to be prepared to make uh, some kind of a, an answer to those kinds of questions. If I had to say one thing that worries me the most about the whole program, it is the same thing that gives me great hope. Okay, now see if I can get this one out. What gives me hope about this is that it is a very ambitious effort to accomplish something monumental in the history and for the future of American education. So I'm, as my son would say, I'm really down with that. (laughs) What worries me about it is that the history of testing and assessment in the United States is littered with examples of good intentions to do too much at once. Assessment systems that are good at providing reasonably good approximations, estimates, indicators of progress on certain kinds of selected domains are usually not too good for purposes of either district level, state level, and certainly individual level accountability. It seems to me as though, once again, we may be heading into a situation where because of resource constraints, because of timeline constraints, because of other kinds of, shall we say, demands, political and otherwise, uh, we will be forced to make big compromises um, as we try to use one assessment system to serve a lot of very different purposes. The idea of using an assessment system to, and let me see if I can uh, quote correctly here, uh, to drive, I think, Laura, you used the word drive. And, and by the way, if this, was, if this was your performance assessment for that class that you never finished, I'm still going to give you an A. Oh. Even though you used the word, even though you, you, you introduced this notion of using tests <clears throat> to drive something, I would be particularly cautious about using tests um, to create incentives for performance on domains that we are trying to measure using the same tests. Mm. This is just, by now we should know this from years and years of trying, that it's a mess. 
I think I'm quoting there from either Dan Quaritz or someone, but it is a mess to try to use tests as a, as a basis for changing the behavior that the tests are intended to measure. I would challenge people to find any other example in the world of measurement, statistics, indicator systems, outside of education, where we, where we pay, place such a heavy burden on a technology that is getting better for sure, but that is probably not quite ready to handle all of what we're expecting it to do. So the short version of that concern is I would encourage both of the consortia to get more specific about the extent to which the tests or the assessments that are being designed are primarily, secondarily, and on down intended to serve specific kinds of ends. The fact that the tests will inevitably be used for purposes beyond those for which they were designed, I take as a given. This is, after all, a free country. And when the results are reported, people will use them to claim all kinds of things that the statisticians will tell us are uh, not valid or reliable. That will happen anyway. And therefore, that, for me, is not a sufficient reason to, to scratch the program. It is, however, an important reason to think ahead preemptively to the possibility that things will suffer those kinds of misinterpretations and then to figure out what we can be doing about it in promoting a healthy use of these systems, in the, recognizing that the upside benefits that we intend to derive from this uh, justify some of the downside unintended consequences. Um, I take that as just a fact of testing life, that there is no testing system that's going to accomplish all of what we want for it at once. But that's not a sufficient reason not to do it. It's just a good reason to be extra careful about it. Uh, finally, on the business of college and career, I know that's the fourth time I've said finally. So, and, and, and then the last. Uh, well, there you go. Uh, this, is, this is really the last thing I'll what, say now until somebody asks me another question. Okay. I, this business of college and career readiness always um, puzzled me a little bit. Um, if for no other reason, then um, we still have, I know and people will argue about this, but we still have among, in, in the world, we still have a very impressive proportion of our college-age population who are going to college, succeeding in college, completing college, and going on in spite of college, to live very happy adult lives. Uh, so I'm a little puzzled by all of this stress about uh, college readiness. Now, as, now that I'm a dean, I am, I think, justifiably stressed about people wanting to continue to go to college. That's a good idea. But it's not clear to me that there's much need for an additional signal using a test about the importance of going to college. A related concern I have is that this mixing of another one college and there. career, it's all part of the same thing. <laughs> this college and career thing I, needs, I think needs to be unpacked just, just a tad. Um, I am not one of those having benefited from college, having watched my children benefit from college, to now be advocating that fewer people should be going to college. I actually think more people should be going to college. That said, I think there is a, a very great need to think about what, what kids who don't go to college uh, learn, where they learn it, how they learn it, what the role of the private sector is in ongoing professional development, uh, and how it is that people who choose different kinds of paths can end up being productive citizens in our democracy. To burden one testing system or two with that, on top of all the other things it's got to do, just seems like uh, you're right to be worried about the 2014 uh, deadline. So, thank you. All right, well, lots of provocative issues put on him before. I want to turn it over to questions in just a minute, but just want to see, Joe, Laura, I don't want to encourage you to go point by point on the things that Michael put on the table, but if it sparked anything <laughs> that you wanted to make sure uh, you were able to get out there before we turn to questions, I'd just give you that opportunity. 
Well, um, probably responding for both of us in, in some regard, uh, Michael, I think many of your points are well taken, particularly with regard to the college and career readiness issue, was, was sort of like it came with a package with regard to the, the application requirements from the department. Uh, so that's not to say that's not a concern, but it, uh, uh, it is to say that uh, it's, uh, it's a concern we, ad we adopted and we now, we're now in the, in the situation of having uh, to deal with. So um, uh, I take your point, uh, take your point though, I think uh, it's well, well made. I guess I'd just add to that that, um, that for me personally and I think from the achieved perspective, college and career readiness has become sort of synonymous with the idea of access for all and opportunity for all. Mm -hmm. And so to think about creating a system that sends very clear messages from the beginning <coughs> about what it means to be college and career ready so that those doors are not closed to any student um, based on things that, you know, have, that have no right to block them, income, parents' education, a guidance counselor making a different decision. Um, but so that if all the signals are clear and the system's very transparent um, about college and career and is that, that your goal of getting more kids into college will, will therefore um, just be an easier thing to achieve. And, and on the thing about driving instruction, since you did pick on me, although you did give me an A, thank you. Um, Standards are falling everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Great inflation, I was going to say. Um, I think the point I was trying to make is that if you have a, a system of assessments that are so transparent and so connected to the kind of in quality instruction that is demanded by the standards, um, that really um, have, for example, in English language arts literacy, have students reading very complex texts and writing about those texts and synthesizing and drawing conclusions and using evidence for the text, and, and that that's what kids do as a matter of course in their, in their classrooms, and then assessments come along that mirror that exactly, that they are uh, reinforcing and supporting one another. So the tests are then, by definition, not a gotcha. They are part of the fabric of of an instructional system. And that, I think, can drive better choices and um, but on everybody's part, at the school level, the teacher level, and on the parent and student level as well. Great. Um, well, I've got lots of questions, so if, you, if there aren't any, I'll, I'll fill in. But I bet there's questions out here, so let's turn. Um, and if you could wait, Joaquin um, will come around with the microphone, uh, or Katrin. And if you could stand and just identify yourself, um, and then please do um, try and keep it. I know folks have lots of perspectives and opinions they want to put on the table, but we've got really an exceptional uh, resource in these three folks today. So I want to make sure we're asking them questions. So um, if you could make it uh, in the form of a question, that would be great. So who, any, anybody want to uh, kick us off? Hi. Um, I'd love to hear each of your unique perspectives on the benefits and risks of computer adaptive testing specifically the benefits and risks of using computer adaptive testing not only to inform instruction but also for accountability purposes. I know that there are some concerns from the disability rights community about the use of computer adaptive uh, testing for accountability um, and about growth, using tests to measure growth more, more generally. I'm wondering if you think uh, whether tests can be improved to the point uh, that we could use computer adaptive testing while also um, allaying those concerns? Sure. Um, actually, I, 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 probably not surprising. I, I think there's more risk associated with not using computer adaptive testing, particularly for uh, youngsters uh, in unique populations or uh, students, uh, which would include students in the highly capable programs as well as students with disabilities or, or uh, 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 learning disabilities. Uh, the reason I think that is that the computer adaptive testing, because it moves the test to where the student is, uh, actually provides much more precise uh, measurement of where the student is uh, than a typically uh, fixed form test, uh, which most of our state tests right now do not do a very good job of assessing where students at the low end or the high end of the performance continuum are, because there's a lot of measurement error out at those extremes. Uh, and if we're going to uh, be committed to how are students improving, if we're going to be committed to providing information about student growth, then it's very important to get precision on both the first test and the next test. Uh, and so that, that just becomes a, a, a very important element. If we do not do that, 
uh, just by virtue of measurement error, we'll see that it will appear as though some students are growing backwards. If you have a lot of measurement error for a, a, either a low-performing or high-performing student, just by error alone, you'll get a high score on the pretest and a low score on the post-test, and it looks like, wait a minute, how is it that you didn't learn anything this year? So the, the precision is very important. The, the concern currently with adaptive testing is really the item density question. That it's hard to get enough items wherever the student is that you, get, you do get good precision. So a, a lot of adaptive testing programs that are now out there and are now in use uh, really falter in, in, that, uh, in that issue. Um, and uh, some of the state testing programs that use adaptive testing just don't have enough items in their item bank to do an adequate job. Uh, our proposal calls for 80,000 items in the item bank, uh, really adding a density across the entire uh, spectrum of student performance so that we do, do address that. We're also, just uh, briefly, we've put into our proposal a commitment uh, to use fairly newly uh, developed uh, standards with regard to identifying and flagging uh, items uh, uh, that can uh, accommodate themselves to what the students needs are as the test is being administered uh, so that we don't have to have uh, a, a uniquely unique and idiosyncratic decisions made about the kinds of accommodations that are best suited for students uh, in in one school versus another but those can actually be associated with the item itself so that uh, we can make decisions uh, a priori with regard to what elements are read first, for example, and are read aloud, what, items, what portions are read second, and so forth and so on. But we can talk a little bit afterwards if you want to get, learn more about that. Can I can just add something to this? I have a, a, a real short answer, I think. And that is that um, one of the great hopes with the advent of high-speed computing <coughs> I don't know whether this relates to computer adaptive testing as much as to the possibility of using sophisticated advanced computing technology to create and to enable much more authentic representations of the cognitive processes that we care about than had been possible uh, before the computers. And this gets you to the nub of one of the great problems in testing, which is that the commitment to a system of mass public education simply doesn't allow economically for every child to be assessed using the equivalent of an encyclopedia's worth of one-on-one -on -one interactions to really derive the true sort of uh, situation with respect to that individual's uh, learning and learning needs and future. So testing has always been a crude approximation for the sake of predicting something about how somebody's going to do based on prior, prior performance. The computer, theoretically at least, gives us an opportunity to create much more authentic representations of complex cognition economically. And that, for me, is part of this revolution that these guys, I hope, are going to be involved in. Uh, one of the last things that our one of our great mentors and, and, and teachers, uh, Bob Glazer, uh, told us was about the importance of cognitive representations using a computer and other kinds of information technology. So there's great hope there, which I hope uh, some of this work will uh, advance. That was short. By 2015. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll just no briefly short. say that um, that uh, this is one of the differences uh, between the two consortia mm -hmm. that the park assessment will be delivered on computer for the I mean you did a great job of explaining why the opportunity for computer enhanced innovative items is huge and particularly when it comes to really getting at cognitive processes and helping um, provide access to students across the ability spectrum so that's a really important aspect of the of the park proposal but not the computer adaptive because the states in the, in the consortium were just not interested in going in that direction during the proposal writing stage. Next question. Oh. Yeah, I'm Diane August from the Center for Applied Linguistics, and I actually have one of the, an issue that would like to sort of raise an issue that Michael also raised, which is thoughts about how to do a good job of sort of val validly assessing the content knowledge of second language learners, especially those children who are quite limited English proficient. 
it's very challenging. There's not a really good research base, and we're talking, as you mentioned, about a very tight timeline here. So any thoughts about that? And as your answer, if you could talk a little bit also about the process that you're going to use to uh, engage these issues or how folks might keep track of, of, of the developments in this area, as well as just sort of how you're thinking about addressing them substantively. Well, actually, that's helpful, because what I was going to say is that we have, a, I don't know what the answer to that is, and I think there's a lot of research and discussion that needs to happen. Uh, in the park process, so I was going to focus on process, um, which, which is to say that there are a number of structures that have been built into the development process that will help with that issue. So first of all, there's a technical advisory committee that will include some of the best researchers and psychometric minds in the country. And we are in the process of, um, of actually identifying who the members of that committee will be. And I know Smarter Balance has just named their TAC. In addition, there will be a, a, a number of task forces or what we're calling technical working groups that focus on a number of really tough issues to crack. And one of those, in fact, one of the first ones to be formed is the one about accommodations for English language learners and for students with special needs. Um, and, and the other one is around the technology challenges. Those are the sort of two that need to come out of the gate the first because they are such critical issues. And I think there's so much work to be done on them. I don't think we have it right necessarily with our current assessment systems and to build a whole new set of assessment systems around um, things that we're already not doing very well, I think is a big challenge. So I'm addressing, I'm acknowledging the challenge more than um, giving a, an easy answer because I don't think there is one. And it, it, it's, a, it's one of these issues that is, uh, becomes even more of a challenge in a cross-state consortium yeah. uh, because of the uh, language diversity. There's language diversity within states, clearly, but across states there's even, even more so. Um, uh, New Mexico is a, a, a member of Smarter Balanced, and Navajo is a prominent second language in, in New Mexico. Well, there's not a whole lot of other states where, <laughs> where, that's, uh, where, where, where that's evident, and if you just kind of count heads, uh, maybe uh, that, that second language issue isn't addressed. But uh, within a New Mexico assessment, it certainly would be. So uh, it, it does, uh, you know, there are, we're not lacking for challenges in that area. Uh, we were uh, uh, awarded a, a $10 million enhancement uh, from the department uh, to uh, address second language issues in, in particular. Um, and uh, in our proposal, it was to uh, address uh, translations into uh, six languages anyway. Um, and that's, there's a whole lot more than six languages out there. Uh, but, uh, and I'm not sure, as is the case uh, with Laura, what Laura described with the park solution, I'm not sure that that's a, that's a hard solution, uh, as, hard as in, you know, a set in stone solution uh, for now, because we do have to answer a lot of very thorny issues with it. But we were both given the assignment from the Department of Education uh, to build an assessment system that would be used for all students except for those with, the, uh, who, with significant cognitive disabilities. So it, including um, uh, English language learners and uh, students with uh, special needs. So that's what we have to, that's our challenge to try to build the best assessment we can. But you're right, it, there's not a whole lot of research, there's not clear answers out there for us yet. Thanks. Uh, I'm Steve DeWitt, I'm with the Association for Career and Technical Education, but I won't talk about the career and college readiness issue even though that's something very interesting to us. Um, my question, I just came back from our convention and uh, this may be too early in the process to ask, but teachers are clamoring for information on how to deliver and get ready for the assessments. I know this is a development grant, but how do you envision that happening? Will it be state to state in terms of how, uh, how this is communicated to teachers and how they're helped to deliver the assessments or anything about that would be helpful? I think both both consortia do have uh, implementation plans that we're imp that we're carry what bring forth uh, very in very short order. Uh, they, they're a little bit different, but they probably have uh, very similar features. Uh, ours uh, engages uh, each of our state, all of our states, uh, in a uh, uh, collaborative uh, efforts with regard to implementing the Common Core and I think you heard Laura already describe uh, that uh, PARC has a, has a similar plan uh, in mind. I wish I could uh, sort of um, clone or bring, bring to 
you know, bring into the room uh, David Coleman and, and Doug Savdi from um, uh, from Park, uh, who were asked the same question at a earlier Aspen event, and basically said, uh, you know, in in the Common Core ELA and the and the Common Core <laughs> Math Standards, it's just teach kids how to solve problems and teach kids how to think critically and expect more of them with regard to producing work. And that's your best, your best method for right now to get into the common core is to get away from the, from the short answer and the, and the kind of the memorization test and get into higher order thinking and your kids will be well prepared. Although Joe, when, when you and I spoke earlier, you talked actually about a pretty ambitious timeline on putting out sample units and can you just characterize what's going to be, because those sounded actually like they'd be quite rich resources for, for teachers. So just can you put a little more meat on those bones? Well, um, Laura will jump in if I misrepresent what PARC is doing, but I think both consortia are, uh, are engaged with developing prototype uh, examples of, uh, uh, of the kinds of tasks and, and complex tasks that students will be presented with uh, in our assessments. Uh, uh, with examples of student responses to those prototypes and uh, what's, what would represent an adequate response, what would represent an inadequate response, uh, build uh, some uh, professional development uh, units around those uh, with regard to uh, helping teachers see the kinds of strategies that uh, would be effective strategies to help students understand uh, how to respond to those uh, more complex tasks. Uh, in our instance, in particular, uh, we're uh, developing uh, a, f a total of 54 of these really pretty large uh, modules, if you will, uh, that would include the prototype and uh, professional development uh, opportunities uh, as well uh, across English language arts and mathematics. And, and I don't know what the number is or if the design is particularly in parallel with PARC, but I think there's enough commonality that the similar kinds of things are rolling out. But, uh, but we're hearing the same question, like, what do I do? What do I need to do next month to make sure that I can get on board with the Common Core? And as you can well imagine, we're not going to have those <coughs> prototypes out there next month. And so, yeah. Yeah, I'll just echo that. I mean, PARC has in its... Uh, plan to do many of the same things Joe just talked about. Um, fast prototypes out in the field so teachers can start working on them and using them in classrooms, um, sample student work, additional surrounding instructional modules, professional development, not just around the assessment but also how to use the data and what it means and why it's going to look different and what, what you do with it. Uh, and, and Park through, um, through its uh, cross-state convening will be building, helping states build individually within their states real rich teacher cadres of people who are well versed in the standards and can go forth and start delivering in state. So I think we're thinking about it to directly answer your question as a both a cross state and consortium wide strategy and then a within state strategy as well. The dollars of the grant will not go far enough to, you know, individually train every teacher across these states. That's not going to happen. So it's going to be really important in states to use existing structures and existing networks. And I think, you know, Joe and I were on a, a call yesterday with the NEA and their affiliates, and we were on a call maybe last month with the AFT. So really figuring out how to use existing teacher networks and build uh, collaboration through them will be important. Well, and I think to, to Michael's point earlier about um, not necessarily wanting the instrument that you're using to measure to actually drive the behavior that you're trying to measure, I think one of the things that, that we're thinking about focusing on in subsequent analysis and, and convenings is where is the curriculum development going to come from? It's, it, if, if we're not expecting it to come necessarily from uh, the assessment consortia, um, which really are about creating the measures themselves, where is the work going to come from that will inform uh, practice at that sort of richer, deeper, uh, more developmental level? Uh, and so I think there's, there, hopefully there's more to come on that. Well, one thing I will say that I forgot to mention is that the PARC consortia did include in its proposal um, a commitment to develop a model curriculum framework, a scope and sequence across the grades and, and a kind of a shell of a curriculum framework, not to be a mandated lockstep curriculum across states. That's not it. And we're not talking national curriculum here. We're talking models that states can pick up and use if they like or use to benchmark what they're doing or use or vendors can pick up and use as models of these are the things that are sort of sanctioned by and agreed to by the states. And so we'll create things that look like that or build out and, and increase the set. Joe mentioned they'll do 54 Many units we will in in our proposal. I think we had 50. Don't quote me. Don't blog that. 
Um, but a number of those that will will not cover you can every block less lesson. Than smarter balance, but <laughs> <laughs> fewer than. Uh, <laughs> but they won't cover every lesson, and they're not designed to. Um, it'll be the job of the field and the and the content area groups. You know, um, CBMS and NCTM and the other um, mathematics mm-hmm, organizations mm-hmm. are already moving forward very quickly to develop some of these tools through their networks and with with existing teachers. So we're going to need a lot of help. Is the bottom line on that? Right back there. Yeah. Steve Ferrara, CTB McGraw-Hill. Um, I'd like to make a brief comment and then pose a question for you to respond to. So first of all, my comment is I hope, Lara and Joe, as you're continuing to discuss what's going on and you talk about collaboration, you begin to, both in your language and your thinking, remember that there's, there are vendors out there that you need to collaborate with in order to make this successful. Uh, and we're all eager to help you with that. We're all eager to collaborate. That said, um, I have a question for you, and I want to put on my educational psychologist hat. Um, and it's about unintended con- consequences. When um, schools start falling behind in their AYP goals, there's a school staff there that's motivated because they're, they're adults, professional adults. There's a school staff there to try to do something about it. What, what, what discussion and thinking might be going on regarding what happens to kids who start, say, fifth graders who are falling behind on college and career readiness? What's going to happen in terms of what, what do you think is going to happen to their motivation and what are the interventions that are likely, what are people going to do to try to help kids who become discouraged or defiant or whatever the case may be? I'll handle the first part. I was going to say the same thing. I'll do the first one. (laughs) I guess you started ahead of me, so you can go. Um, Well, Ed, I I know I can speak for both of us. We will not try to do all of this on our own, and we do very much intend to engage with uh, uh, with partners in the uh, in the service provider uh, uh, area. Um, And there's just no question about that. We we know we're going to engage with it now. What shape that's going to take, you know, how many RFPs and how big they will be, and what their scale will be, uh, I, I don't really qu- quite yet know. Uh, it, it would be more than one. Um, and um, But even so, before that, I think you're pushing um, for, and, and many um, vendors have, have contacted Park and probably have contacted Smarter Balance to say, what, what can we do to help? How can we help inform the conversation? And I think it's sort of incumbent upon us to, to figure out how to do that in a way that's appropriate and doesn't um, create conflict of interest for anybody down the road, and that's going to yeah, have to happen but quickly. It's, it's an interesting dance. How can we help but not jeopardize exactly. our capacity to uh, to compete kind of a right. thing? Uh, and there's another, now that you bring up the, the vendor thing, there's another dynamic out here that is really something that we do need to talk about, just, just sit around and figure out how we're going to resolve. All state contracts come to a sharp end on you know, end of the August 2014, something like that, and start new contracts in 2014. So how do we coordinate that effort so that for states it is a coordinated effort and not a a tear your hair out and and, and so forth and so on? And that might be something where the service provider community and the consortia communities can sit down together and figure out what would make sense, not like who's going to get which, which piece of the action, but but how can we stage this so that it works for people? And so that's, that's something to think through. So I'll let Laura answer the second question. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. That is a... So uh, much for collaboration. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah, it, from my mind, it is a, a natural unintended consequence of having a very much of a high bar uh, with regard to college and career readiness and setting the standard there. And it's this tension... Uh, between access and making sure that we have uh, high expectations for every student. It cert- kind of gets back to that black box of what's inside a student's head issue is for any individual student, we don't really know whether or not if we really push, they're going to be able to kind of get to this really high level. You just don't know. So you have to have student by student that expectation. But in the aggregate, we do know that not everybody is going to uh, going to aspire to to that place, and so how do you uh, how do you wrestle with that uh, with that that conflict? And uh, I don't know. It's something we will have to be 
you know, have to be mindful of. And, you know, right now, it's like if, you don't, if you're not called proficient in your state, we must be a failing school. Our kids must be failing kind of a thing. It, it kind of goes, goes, I think your question is right on point with that. And, uh, it's, it's a legitimate concern, I think. I would just add that, I, that it creates extra incentives for kids if they know that there's a payoff in the end. It's, it's like European systems at which, uh, for which the, the end of high school test, that, that exit test really means uh, it's opening a door somewhere else. And, and that um, Andrea Schleicher was here uh, this week. Uh, and presented on, on the, P, the latest PISA results, but also said in, in, in countries where there are meaningful, real incentives and real um, stakes on, on assessments, for, the, you know, exa- for example, those that get you um, entry into a post-secondary institution, um, students just do better on them. They, they're more meaningful to students uh, because they have... Well, you don't, you're going to doubt me on that, but no, no, I, I'm just I, quoting I Andreas. Uh, because because the systems are geared towards that. Um, what that means for kids who aren't on track or who don't get in, I, I think you're raising a legitimate and very important concern. I think it's going to require systems to create different kinds of supports and have um, and have a better structure for delivering supports. Maybe it means creating flexibility in terms of time and not thinking about um, we're going to have to disassociate ourselves from graduation in 12 years and by the end of X grade and think about, well, students can still be on track to meeting college and career ready goals, but maybe not at the same time at, as their peers. And maybe just uh, connecting that a little bit could be helpful. But you're raising tough issues that the states are going to have to grapple with. I must say, there, there, were time, there have been times when I think, gee, if I could only go back to fifth grade, it would be so, you know, now I'd know how to do it and really enjoy my youth. <laughs> but when I hear this, I must say, I'm, I think I'm glad that when I was in fifth grade, only people who were kidding were asking me, what college do you want to go to? <laughs> well, although, I mean, it's just interesting. When, when you ask students themselves, I mean, really the Sixth overwhelming know, majority right. Right, say that they actually aspire to college, well, and I think of this huge disconnect. Uh, so there's, I, I mean, I think, I, I guess, I, I understand the premise, but I would take some issue with it. I think there's the possibility that this actually could be quite um, motivating, uh, as opposed to seeing it as largely demotivating, um, if students see these goals as something that actually connects with their own personal aspirations as opposed to something that is just sort of has to do with this kind of abstract notion of wh- how people view their school, um, which does, isn't necessarily um, really so motivational for right. them. Right. It's a potentially very empowering for students. And actually, I was just talking to someone from New York City, and New York City is looking f- towards a future where um, there's a lot of flexibility and, and, and it's very student-centered. Uh, their future, their school of the future, student-centered as opposed to teacher-centered. And imagine a student who has the information in sixth grade, hey, I'm not on track. What are you doing, teacher X, Y, and Z, to help me get on track? Um, That would be a very savvy sixth grader, but you can envision a future where that might be the case. Any sixth grader who's that savvy doesn't need all of these tests. (laughs) See, Ross, I might take issue with your your premise, because I think... In the first early years of this program, uh, this will be a real issue because uh, these will be high bars. Uh, This is not like uh, this will these will be like NAEP like standards, Uh, and we will have very few youngsters uh, uh, who will be uh, as fifth, sixth, seventh graders declared to be kind of on on target to become college and career ready. And there will be a lot of youngsters for whom they will think, well, the test said I'm not, I'm not college material, so I don't see why. That's, I mean, that's going to be a real dynamic in the early years. I think the vision in the out years is a, is a good vision to have and something we should strive for, that, hey, you know what, this does not mean you're not college ready. It just means you need to kind of, you, let's, let's see what we need to do to boost you to get you there. Uh, but that's that's a description of a mature system, uh, and I don't think in the first few years we will be at that place. So I, I think it's a real it's a that's real fair. challenge. Let me just ask a, actually a follow up question, it's almost on a, of a technical nature. So when the when the tests come out in the first year, uh, you know there is this vision that we'll be reporting growth and progress. In the first year, will we only report sort of the first kind of the baseline results, and and individual students and schools will get their Baseline and how, like, how will you? Is there a, a sense that you'll be kind of imputing growth from the prior test scores, or will it, like, 
How's that going to so work in that first year that this comes the online? Tests and I think the they're tests. just going to set the first denominator at zero, which means growth will be infinite and we'll all be very happy. <laughs> If we understand it. <laughs> well, it'll be 2014, so all students will be we'll proficient. Be proficient so. <laughs> all right. I don't know. I, I don't know. know. Must be I don't know the answer to your the question. The growth modeling is going to be The growth a, modeling a will be hard, but yeah, we don't know. All right, so we've got two more. I know Joaquin's over here, and then Trini will pick the last one. And okay. Uh, I'm Sarah Silverman, and first I want to say thank you so much. This was very informative. Um, I was particularly struck by the, um, the point about doing a few things well rather than a bunch of things crappily, and I appreciate that point. But it seems to me that particularly in the environment we're currently in, where teacher evaluation is becoming particularly salient in, in most states, that many states are going to want to use these assessments to inform evaluation. So my question for you specifically is, what relation should this, these assessments have to teacher evaluation? That's a great question. What well, was included as in the NIA, that mm -hmm. the assessments developed by these consortia could be used for the purpose of teacher evaluation. So it is the intention of both consortia, um, simply by nature of applying to participate, that the assessments, assessments would enable those um, decisions. And their implications for what you do as you build those assessments so that they can be used fairly and validly for those purposes. And each consortium is going to have to build that into its design and development model. So we've aligned ourselves to the uh, Joint Committee for Standards uh, in Educational Evaluation uh, that have standards for evaluating uh, programs, uh, evaluating students, and evaluating educational personnel. Um, and so sort of using that as our guidepost with, with regard to the uh, kinds of uh, criteria that we feel we need to put into place to make sure that the assessments have enough stability and integrity that if they are used for some of those purposes, uh, we can withstand scrutiny. Uh, I, that wasn't exactly your question, though. There, I think your question is, so, you know, what can you, uh, could you evaluate the music teacher in fifth grade, you know, sort of a thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think, uh, I, I'm a former state uh, employee, so I get to say, uh, that's a local decision, uh, and uh, but in, in some level, I think that's a within state uh, and in some instances within local jurisdiction decision about the ways in which these data uh, end up being used for evaluation purposes. Uh, do, it, does it contribute to what's going on in the school and the unit of analysis a, is a school? Uh, does it drill down into the classroom teacher uh, level for where there is true attribution of uh, of assignment of students to teachers for certain kinds of instruction and then what do you do with the PE teacher or the librarian or whatever. Uh, but I don't think the assessment system is drilling down quite into that grain size. Although, to uh, Michael's point, uh, we need to be aware of that uh, potential use and know whether or not we have the, the, the rigor uh, for it to be used for those purposes. One additional thing is that that really um, reminds both of us probably of the need to have teachers engaged in the process because mm. if that is an intended use and teachers have not been inside the tent, as it were, then, then that's going to create a political problem down the road. So it really does uh, require, for, and for good reason, uh, teachers to be involved. Hi, I'm last Tom. question. Thanks. The last Ross. question. Lucky a lot of pressure. Tom seems to yeah, wait, wait till you hear the answer. On us or on him? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, my name is Tom Todd. Uh, it seems as if uh, the assumption of both of your groups is that the NCLB proficiency-based accountability model will have disappeared by 2014 or by the time your <coughs> tests are, are introduced because currently um, that model has, has created a strong incentive for states to lower their standards. Um, so I wanted to get your reaction to that. I was also wondering uh, to what extent you think that PISA type tests are, are might be models uh, that you're looking at. Thank you. You want to jump on the PISA thing because the international benchmarking? Well, so international benchmarking is, is a goal of the consortia, uh, particularly a goal of PARC. Is it is, is for Smarter Balance as well? Okay, so an international benchmarking means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Um, 
first and foremost, we know that the standards were internationally benchmarked, the Common Core standards, to the extent that um, the standards writers looked across other countries. They used other countries' standards as models and benchmarked against them as they went, just to have a check on rigor. It was really heartening, actually, to hear Andreas um, earlier in the week to say, uh, again, I've heard him say it before, but not so directly, how well aligned the standards are to the standards in high-performing countries on PISA. Um, not exactly, again, a match, a one-to-one match, but generally speaking, a very strong alignment, which was a good thing to hear that we're, we're, we've set the bar at the right place. Uh, thinking about how to instantiate that in assessments um, is another question, and I think the assessment consortia are both thinking about whether there might be an opportunity to embed some PISA items or, um, or TIMS items into the into the assessments to, to kind of a direct link to make comparisons or whether there's a different way of equating a different technical solution to that. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But on the question of whether there might be some PISA-like items, I think it's the goal certainly of PARC and also of Smarter Balance to have a heavy dose of performance items, um, performance-based as- items that ask kids to do strategic problem solving. Um, I'm thinking in mathematics now to, to use um, pull from an arsenal of tools and actually apply them to new and novel situations. And so I think there's a real opportunity through the performance um, pieces of the park assessments, which will mostly be in the through course assessments, to do some of that application and um, longer problem solving. So yes, we're hoping that will be the case. What was the first question? Oh, you get that what, first question. Uh, uh, I think with regard to No Child Left Behind, yeah. and, and is it has it been left? Be, has, has it been left behind? Yeah, has it been left behind? <laughs> um, and uh, it, that sort of loops back to a comment uh, uh, we made earlier with regard to the importance of uh, uh, the uh, ESEA reauthorization, uh, because uh, No Child Left Behind was a particular model for that reauthorization in what was it, 2000, 2001, um, and it. Uh, these assessment consortia are built upon some assumptions uh, with regard to what uh, student uh, learning and what uh, what acquisition of learning and progress through schools will mean and how it will be interpreted. Um, and so, uh, in a sense, we need to pass that through the filter of Congress and make sure that uh, that we're all on the same page. Uh, and so, it's a it's just a very important element of our. Uh, of our moving forward, but um, yes, I think it would be a fair assumption to say that the model for No Child Left Behind is inconsistent with the uh, with the model of change that that we're we're looking at here. Um, and before people get up and run away, I uh, for, I want to thank everybody for oh my goodness on a Friday afternoon just before the holidays coming and listening about testing. Uh, it's just a pleasure to know that there's people as disturbed as I am. <laughs> well, so and, wonderful. So, and I hope, oh, really? We, we, we've actually got, um, we're going to have a little reception out here, and I know there's lots oh, more nice. questions. I hope um, that all of, of you will be able to stick with us for a little bit. Um, you know, as, as Michael um, pointed out in his comments, we really are at the beginning of, of what has the potential to be a transformational um, set of activities for public education. So really just want uh, to thank everybody, and especially uh, if folks could join me in, in thanking um, our experts for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, for thank you. Now we have to give the mics back. Let's do that. <laughs>